Well, good morning, everyone. I'll tell you what, we are having so much fun in Sunday school, it is hard to get in here early. So if I didn't get to say hi to you uh, this morning, hopefully I catch you on the way out. Uh, but we are really having a good time. Um, there, I won't lie to you, there are some headbenders. Uh, because the revelation is, is a very difficult topic. Uh, but having a complete and full understanding is not the purpose of our class. The purpose of our class is to grow together in fellowship and in our faith in Jesus Christ. And we are growing in our faith. Uh, we are having some wonderful, healthy discussions about life and how it applies to us today and not just what's in the book of Revelation. So I encourage you to join us uh, for Sunday school uh, at 9 o'clock. So um, we'll get going with worship. Joan has some announcements uh, for us. Then uh, she'll lead us in our call to worship. And then we'll begin with a prayer and opening hymn. Good morning. Good morning. 
Uh, for our announcements, they're also in your bulletin. Um, if you have joys or concerns, please send them to Pastor Scott via email or text. You can also call our prayer chain. Um, as Pastor Scott was saying, Sunday school meets at 9 a.m., and it sounds like it's a very uh, enthusiastic uh, conversation and group, so feel free to join on the Sunday school. Um, as of last Sunday, we have uh, started the um, passing of the plate, so we'll continue that practice moving forward. Also, beginning June, we will resume our monthly uh, communion schedule, so we'll look forward to that coming, I think, June 6th, the first Sunday. A uh, few other uh, announcements. There are still Sundays available for the altar flowers, so please, uh, you know, you can go and sign up on the calendar or contact Martha. And today, the altar flowers are in honor of Benjamin Cushing, graduating from Simmons University in Boston, and that's given by his grandmother, Robin Hughes. So thank you, Robin. And with that, we'll have our call to worship. Jesus calls us. Please stand. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's all right. Jesus calls us. Out of life's great struggles. Jesus calls us. Out of our love for worldly things. Jesus calls us. To be in full obedience. Jesus calls us. To love him more than all. Let us pray. Lord, as we come here today to worship you, let us remember that everything truly should be about you. Lord, we get caught up in this world and of worldly things. Let us set, them th set those things aside uh, for this hour uh, and allow us to turn our hearts, our eyes, our minds, and our souls to you. Lord, let us be open to the message that you have for us today. And Lord, it is my genuine prayer that it is your word that is heard today and not mine. Allow your message to dwell richly in people's hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we ask and pray all of this through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let us sing our opening hymn, number 398, Jesus Calls Us, verses 1, 4, and 5. we come together for our time of joys and concerns, uh, let us uh, continue to pray for Jake Sullivan. Um, he, uh, some of his treatments are really uh, zapping him uh, and his energy, so just continue to pray for him and Carol um, on that. Um, uh, continue to pray for Carla's dad. Um, we don't have a whole lot to pass on because they're continuing the same treatments from last week. Um, there's uh, a gastrointestinal person who wants to do some additional procedures, but the kidney and heart doctor don't want him to do it because he's not strong enough. And so it's a battle of, of Dr. Will right now. And um, so just continue to pray for them. Um, and uh, 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 other than that, I don't have any additional uh, concerns that have been given to me ahead of time. Are there any other joys and concerns to share today? Ethan, 
Uh, Ethan would like prayer for his ear. Uh, we made a trip to the emergency room this morning uh, to get a prescription for antibiotics, and we pray that that is what works for him. Uh, on that, it's kind of a weird thing, but just uh, prayers that his ear gets better soon because he is not feeling well. But he battled to be here this morning and, and uh, to uh, work with Rick back here on our tech. So we appreciate that, Ethan. Uh, any other uh, joys and concerns? Martha. Oh, that's right. So uh, little Drew uh, Moser uh, got tubes put in his ears uh, on Friday. And that procedure, like Martha said, went really well. Uh, but like most of us, waking up from that anesthesia is not pleasant. Uh, but other than that, everything is going good. So uh, good news, Andro. Any others? All right. At this time, we're going to read the names of our graduates that were given to me. Uh, and then after I get done reading this list, if you have any additional people that you would like to recognize, we'll recognize them. Now, I know almost half this last list belongs to Robin, but she's got a lot to be proud of this year because uh, Nicholas Cushing graduated from the University of Cincinnati Law School. Uh, Benjamin Cushing, uh, as you in the flowers were mentioned, from Simmons University in Boston, and Zachary Cushing from the Ohio State Nursing Center. Uh, so I think she told her grandkids she, they better take good care of her, right? <laughs> So they've certainly got the, the pedigree to do that. Um, uh, celebrating Samantha or Sammy Tarson uh, from nursing school. Uh, Peyton Stenson, the University of Cincinnati. Uh, Monroe Alexander Seymour from Fairfield High School and Butler Tech. Ashley Sullivan, University of Cincinnati Engineering School. Casey Spangler, uh, who uh, graduated this summer from US Army Boot Camp, and he's in his advanced training now. Uh, and probably one of the biggest smiles today is from Kathy Kubelow because Elijah is now a high school graduate and graduate of Great Oaks. Uh, so it is a great joy um, uh, for uh, parents and grandparents and aunts, and uncles, and friends uh, to celebrate our graduates. Does anybody else have another person they'd like to acknowledge? Donna. So uh, Don, uh, John and Donna Coleman's granddaughter, Abby, uh, who didn't get to celebrate her official graduation last year, got to do that this year. And in addition, uh, not only did she get her degree in accounting from UK, she went and got her master's uh, in accounting as well, correct? So that's a great celebration. Any others? All right, let us join together in a time of prayer. And... Um, uh, then we'll join together in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Heavenly Lord, uh, we uh, come to you in prayer each and every week. Uh, but Lord, let it not just be this time that we do our prayers. Uh, allow us to be people who take home these prayers and pray over this list on a daily basis because our prayers are powerful. And Lord, let us not forget our time of prayer on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock that we may join together uh, uh, in unison, uh, just to take time away from our day uh, to honor you through prayer. Uh, Lord, uh, there are many who are in need on our uh, prayer list, and we ask your hand to continue to move in them. And Lord, we give you praise for the many answered prayers uh, that continually uh, are answered. Um, and But uh, Lord, today we set aside some time to celebrate and honor uh, many people who are graduating um, and from different types of schools and different types of life events. Uh, and Lord, uh, what a celebration it is. Lord, we are grateful for all the parents and teachers, counselors, uh, and anybody else uh, associated with them at their school and along their path of life that have given them encouragement and hope, um, that have given them some discipline when they've needed it, uh, push them along, help them get to where they are. 
Lord, we ask that uh, in this time of celebration uh, that uh, we are able to point people towards you and know that you are a great and, and giving God. And may they use these gifts from their graduation. May they use these degrees and may they use their, their, their education and their talent uh, for your good and for your glory. Let us always remember that uh, things that we have here on earth are just tools that we use uh, to do things that honor you and lead other people to Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we remember your son, we remember this prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture readings today come from Isaiah and Luke, starting with the Old Testament, Isaiah 58, verses 7 through 10. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. From Luke 12, verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. The word of God for the people of God. Uh, just one update on the prayer list that I forgot to take off this week. Mike Henderson is doing better, correct? So I forgot to take that off. So, But that's a joy. So good to take that off. Now for our time of offering.
please rise for the doxology. Gracious Lord, we have come to present these gifts of tithes and offering to you. Lord, you are a generous and giving God. And to those who have given abundantly, that you have given to abundantly, may we return abundantly. Lord, let us be a people who have a heart of a giving heart. And let us remember that you are the true source of all good gifts. Lord, let us have good and, and faith uh, in you that when we give, uh, that uh, and when we give as you called us to give, uh, that you will indeed take care of us and you will meet each and every one of our needs. Uh, Lord, let us just uh, continue to be a church that continues to grow closer to you so that we may reach others in, in your son's name and bring them to salvation. All of this we ask and pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please remain standing for our next hymn. I believe it's hymn 453. <laughs> aren't very excited today. Let's try it again. Whoever has ears, Let them hear. is it the heat? I won't make you do it again. That should get an amen. Well, if you have kids, if you have siblings, if you have co-workers, if you follow politics, there is one thing you have definitely heard, and that's the phrase, it's not fair. And what do most of us say? Well, at least to our kids, we say, well, life is not fair, which is easy to say when you're on the good side of things, isn't it? 
when the rules work to your favor, when the outcome is what you wanted. But there are plenty of it's not fair moments in life, isn't there? If you're a fan of sports, we cry foul when the refs make a bad call in the game, don't we? We say it's not fair when a coworker gets a raise or a promotion, and we don't. And I have been at funeral homes when people start arguing over mom's rings or over another precious item that somebody took from the house that somebody else was promised. It just isn't fair. The same could be said for the Bible. There are many times when people cry out, it's not fair. Going back to our scriptures from Luke, it says, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. This person said, Jesus, life isn't fair. Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, why would this man ask Jesus to do this? Well, first of all, if you were known as a rabbi or a great teacher, you were very well respected. And people would use them in a similar manner that someone would go to the justice of the peace to settle a dispute. And of course, everybody knew Jesus was a proponent of the little guy, right? Jesus was the defender of the downtrodden. Jesus was the challenger of the status quo. And so this guy said, surely Jesus will be on my side on this one. I'm the little guy. It's unfair. Jesus will take my side on this one. Because you see, according to Jewish law, the eldest son would get two-thirds of the inheritance, while any other sons would be left to split the other one-third. So if there were 11 sons, for example, the oldest would get two-thirds of the inheritance, and the other 10 would split what was left. That means they got one thirtieth, right? Any math teachers in here? <laughs> and here we see that this man thinks this is unfair. Just because I was born second, should I be any less than the older son? Jesus, can you make this right? Can you make this equal? Can you tell him we got to split it 50-50? And Jesus' response is almost quite humorous. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator between you? He's saying, Really? You're coming to me with this? But you have to understand, if you read the scriptures ahead of that, Jesus had been speaking to thousands that day. And his sermons were on some pretty serious subjects. He said, take a stand for your faith and don't fear death. Jesus preached that a person should be focused on him, the one who has the power over the afterlife. Jesus said, you should fear me, fear the Lord, for I have the power to send somebody to heaven or hell. I mean, these are some very serious teachings, very deep things about life, death, heaven, and hell. And then here comes this man who has the audacity to go to Jesus about something so petty. You want to talk to me about your inheritance from your dad when I'm talking about heaven and hell? I mean, come on, man. Why, why are you coming to me about this? I mean, imagine facing a life-threatening crisis. And your doctor is going over life-saving treatment options. And someone interrupts the doctor and says, Excuse me, we got a question. 
Should we use plastic band-aids or cloth band-aids for this scratch over here? You'd be like, we're talking about my cancer here, and, and you've got a question about band-aids? And so here's the living Messiah talking about people's eternal life. And someone comes to them and says, Jesus, can you settle this inheritance issue? And this is how Jesus responds. Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in abundance of possessions. That verse speaks for itself. And if it was up to Danny, we could just leave it there, right? Sermon over. It speaks for itself. But Jesus didn't stop there, so I'm not either. To illustrate this point further, he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, good job. You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. I mean, he says, you can't just go through life, kick your feet up, and think it's just good. Because you can't take it with you. All that wealth does you no good. And I think the story hits almost all of us. And it doesn't just have to do with material wealth. Many of us are guilty, my family included, guilty of trying to get everything we can out of this life instead of focusing on what really matters. Our primary focus in life shouldn't be this life. No, no, no. What we should be concerned about is our eternal lives. Our life is full of stuff, education, careers, activities, cell phones, internet, TV, politics, and on and on the list goes. And we get so caught up in collecting, doing, and managing that most of us have lost focus on what's really important. Following the parable, Jesus goes into a very commonly heard message about worry. We often use this passage to comfort those that are struggling with not having stuff. But the real intention of this passage are for those who are consumed with what they have and consumed with getting even more. Verse 22, then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear, for life is more than food and the body more than clothes. You think we could substitute into that verse? Life is more than politics. Life is more than sports. Life is more than cars and boats and houses and rears and 401ks. Life is more than you fill in the blank. In verse 24, he says, Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. In verse 25, Who of you by worrying, can add a single hour to your life. 
Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? There are things that we do not need to be concerned about because things like our education and jobs are just tools that we can use for God's will. But honestly, look at your life and see what consumes you. See what worries you. Are you up at night thinking about lost souls or are you worried about the Dow Jones losing points? Are you up at night thinking about politics or pandemics rather than the spiritual needs of your family? And Jesus continues in verse 27. Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you? You of little faith. Those are harsh words, aren't they? You of little faith. You of little faith. And he continues, And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. There is a big difference between needs and wants, isn't there? Most of us have our needs met, and some of them are met a little better than others. I'm guilty. And most of us are busy chasing our wants. And in the meantime, while we're out chasing our wants, we are missing out on the mission of Christ. Because the scriptures tell us, if you are living in the will of God, if you're doing his will, seeking his way, living out the way he has called you to live, it says you're going to be taken care of. Maybe not the way you want, but what you need. Jesus says, seek God first then everything else will fall into place. Yet how do we live? Well, we start by paying the bills, right? Checks come in, mortgage, utilities, car payment, insurance. Then we take care of our wants. Long week. I deserve to go out to dinner, right? Be a nice day for a trip. And then, and then we pay God. And that doesn't just include our money. This isn't about money. We use our time and our talents to serve ourselves. Then if there's any energy left over, if there's any time left over, maybe, just maybe, I will give to God. If I'm not too busy this Sunday, I'll, I'll be at church. If I'm not too busy, I'll join you for that mission. God says, follow me first. Give to me first. And then let's see what happens.
because this is even hard for me. Be a little easier now that school's out for the summer. But do you wake up each day and say, God, how can I serve you? Do you wake up each day and say, God, today show me how I can grow closer to you? Do you say, God, how can I do more to spread the gospel and lead others to Jesus Christ? Or do we wake up and say, like the old commercial, oh, time to make the donuts. Time to get back to the ground. To, oh, sorry, to the grind. <laughs> Can't even read. But don't we do that? Whew. Another day, another dollar, another day, another problem. Wouldn't it be nice if we learned from Christ and say, Lord, these are petty disputes. I will do my part to be responsible according to your teachings. But I leave the outcomes to you. Wouldn't that be a good way to live? Just to say, God, I am going to go do whatever you called me to do. I'm not going to worry about it because the outcomes are up to you. That was a hard lesson I had to learn in my first appointment as a senior pastor. I preached my heart out, laid down some really good, good messages, and everybody just kept sitting on their hands every Sunday. Come on, people, let's go! And Carla had to tell me, you can't make people go. The Holy Spirit makes people go. You preach, let God do the work. In God's time and in God's way. And Jesus concluded his teaching with this. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail where no thief comes near and no moths destroy. And then he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus says, aim for treasures in heaven, not for treasures on earth. Not one person on this earth has ever left with any of their possessions. Many cultures in the ancient East and the Middle East had practices where rulers were buried with treasures and with armies. Sometimes they were stone figures carved out and buried, and sometimes it was real people who were killed and martyred and buried with the king so then when he went to the eternal life, he'd have an army with him. He would have gold with him. He would have swords. He would have weapons. He would have all these things in the next life. But as you know, these tombs have been opened. And guess what? Everything they were buried with is still there. Not one of them took their possessions to the afterlife. When we live with our hearts focused on God, when we are living out of the love of Christ, then the things of this life suddenly don't matter as much because we know what lies ahead for eternity. Isn't it time that we start living above all this pettiness? Ask yourself, where is your heart? Is this life about you, or is this life about God? For wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Whoever has ears, 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you want to give to us in abundance, but all too often we do not know how to receive it because all too often we are greedy and selfish with what you have given us. Lord, let us not be consumed by what we have or what we don't have, but let us be consumed about giving to you in the way that you have called us to give. And Lord, whether we are called to give a little or called to give a lot, whether we are called to give our time, whether we are called to give of our gifts, whether we're called to give of our presence, or we're called to give of the, the, the financial gifts that you've given us, whatever it is you've called us to give, Lord, let us just give freely, knowing that if we do it for you, not for our own glory, but for your glory, that you will be pleased and that you will take care of us. Let us have genuine faith. Let us put our hearts on you. Let us no longer look at ourselves. All of this we ask and pray for in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us stand and sing our closing hymn. Hymn number 399, Take My Life and Let It Be. Verses 1, 2, and 3. started his own business he had twenty dollars and a dream and he started with a five thousand square foot facility and I was one of his first employees and I helped install every piece of equipment and I worked there through high school through college and then I got sucked into the business and for 28 years I was in that business until I was owner and vice president of that business and every week, I liked it when I was 15 and all I had to do was come in and paint parts, just paint parts. But then I had to run a shift and I was in charge of people and it got a little harder. And then I was in charge of all the sales. And then I was in charge of managing the whole company, including the books 
and making payroll and making sure this vendor was paid and that vendor was paid and this supplier was on time and our stuff to the customers was on time and what happened when the truck broke down and, and on and on and on and the pressure was hard. And I was focused on making that business go. My dad started it and we went from 5,000 square feet to 40,000 square feet. We went from $20,000 a month sales to, to, uh, to 80 to 100,000 to where we were doing millions of dollars a year of sales. And business never ended. And some of you know that. There's never a vacation. There's never a day off. There's always a phone call, always something. And man, and God said, sell that business and go do something else because I have a calling for you. And that was tough because that was my dad's business that I was selling. But my partner and I came to an equitable agreement and he bought me out within two weeks after I said yes to God. And I was out. God found me a job the very next week making a lot less money. But somehow God has provided for our needs all along the way. And my dad would call me up and said, did you hear they lost such and such customer and they're doing this and they're doing that? And I said, it's not mine. The burden is off of me. Whether they make a million dollars or the business folds, it's off my shoulders. I don't have to worry about it anymore. And now when I listen to my boss on the phone who says, what? The garage door won't be delivered for another eight weeks? I go, not my problem. Right? But that's the way it is with God. When we stop being the boss, when we stop owning everything and sell it and say, God, it's yours. You've got to worry about it. What do you want me to do today, God? That's all I need to do. Just like my job. My boss says, I want the stairwell built today. Okay, I'll build you a stairwell. If he calls halfway through it and says, no, I need you to leave to go do a plumbing job. Okay, I mean, it's, it's nice. But that's how it should be with God. We're following God, we're listening to God, and the pressure's on him. If we're doing what God wants, the pressure's on him. We don't have to worry about things. We need to stop stressing about life and building stuff and doing things and, 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 and getting everything. Now, we need to be good stewards of what God gives us. We need to be responsible. We need to use these tools of education and job and finances. We need to be smart so that we can reproduce and do more. But they're tools for what purpose? For God. And when we turn it over to God, it is life-changing. It is freeing. And we can say, it doesn't matter what happens in Washington. doesn't matter what happens locally. Because it's all for God, and it's all about God. May you leave here and let go of possessing and give it to God. Let him have control, and your burdens will change. Your vision will change. Your hearts will change will change. Go now and leave here being people of God and not people of this world. Leave now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of his Holy Spirit. Amen.